Um, today, I, I just want to invite you uh, just to take a moment and just take a breath with me uh, to put your feet on the ground and just to really like get yourself in a comfortable spot. We're going to be talking about climate impacts, which carry emotions of sadness and grief, devastation and joy, community and sorrow, hope and resilience, loss, grief. So I just want to invite you to breathe with me for a moment. And so I'm really excited to get to join together today with some colleagues and friends who I deeply respect for our session. Uh, and so today we'll get to be working on repairing and resisting, learning about how people are organizing uh, after and around climate impacts. And so uh, on the docket for today, we've got three speakers. Um, so Jacintha, uh, who's uh, coming to us from 350. She's one of my colleagues with the Pacific Climate Warriors. She can introduce herself more about sort of her context and where she's coming from, uh, but someone who I, I've had a, gotten a lot of respect for. And Jennifer is coming from 350 Canada. Um, so excited that there's so many Canadians on this call as well to, to share in the lessons that she's been bringing about uh, dealing with uh, some of the recent uh, climate impacts happening in Canada. And so bringing that story. And then Derek uh, is joining us from the Philippines. And um, we're hoping the tech is gonna work out right now. Um, the Philippines are having a, a typhoon. This is not a this is a more common experience that's happening now uh in the philippines and so uh she's working off on her own battery and so hopefully uh we're hoping that the 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 zoom energy will work out and she'll be able to join us successfully for the whole thing um and i it, it we we just couldn't go too far without acknowledging uh that um Sorry, my screen share didn't work here, but I, I just, I, we can't go too far without just acknowledging right off the back um, that uh, right now, one of the major climate impacts, I think one of the largest we've ever seen is happening right now in Pakistan. Um, and so some of our colleagues who have been working right now in Pakistan and, and working in Southeast Asia on, on that crisis right now, um, they're all sleeping <laughs> right now, and we're delighted that they're sleeping. They did join us for a call earlier to to share with us some of the the things that they've wanted to to have expressed and so forth during this time. But it's it's important to mark this is a phenomenal flood if you have not tracked. Um, it, its size has been absolutely catastrophic, um, and so one in seven people have been directly impacted by this uh, this flood. There have been tens of thousands of deaths. They're, they're still tracking the numbers. Um, and it, it's very much, I think, part of what brings us to this session, which is these climate impacts are coming for more and more of us. If we have not experienced them directly, uh, we will beginning to have more, more and more direct experiences. And those of us who are experiencing them already, they are likely to continue to increase in their uh, extremity. That's the reality of, of what, the, what climate change is bringing. So that kicks up, I think, fear of what may come, as well as uh, other feelings. And so during this session, we want to um, honor and support. Uh, in terms of what people are asking for with our colleagues in Pakistan in a moment, we'll paste um, some links uh, that people have asked us to share, both places for just giving money, if that's a, you know, a thing that you have available uh, for folks on the ground. Um, but also uh, dealing with um, centering what the problem is here, which is this isn't just a, a humanitarian crisis, it is that, but it's also a crisis of, of an injustice, which is an, a country that has spent very little amount of carbon is suffering greatly. And this is the issue that we're dealing with. This is, this is why we're here today, because of the injustice that's happening. And so, um, so we'll be facing some resources, but, but just centering back that this is caused by the fossil fuel industry. Uh, this has been very much directly related to that. And, and so I just, I, I very much want to honor, um, Dawood, thank you for joining us. Um, 
uh, from Pakistan at this moment. And so I just, I really want to honor the, the feelings, the expressions of solidarity and to hopefully this can be a spot, a space for inspiration and, and support. So I'll be post, post the, pasting those links in just a moment, um, but I do just want to express our heartfelt um, connection to all of that. And um, I think I want to want to just open it up pretty quickly for us to go uh, and hear from Derek, uh, because Derek has been um, also facing uh, a phenomenal crisis. And so, Derek, I want to just bring you in to talk about what you've been doing. Derek's worked in the Philippines, um, and she'll tell her own story. I don't need to give an introduction about that. But she's a community organizer. She knows what it looks like to do on the ground organizing. Um, uh, she's been based in a, a, a region, the Bataan, um, that's been facing coal and nuclear. And so she's been part of an organization that's been pushing particularly coal, which is Philippines is one of the one of the biggest coal. They're still producing and, and, and adding more power plants all the time to, to try to expand their energy sources that way. And so um, so she's coming, bringing her story about how both how we deal with climate impacts uh, in the moment. And what are the lessons about how we organize even in that moment, even in the devastation? So thank you so much uh, for joining us, Derek. And if you wanna come off mute and hopefully our internet will hold uh, for your presentation, thank you. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to say one more thing, uh, which is if people have questions along the way, please just go ahead and paste them in, uh, write them onto the chat uh, or the question and answer, and we'll try to respond as many as much as we can. People have been using it as a chance to organize. Other, the Canadians have been doing good, good at that over these sessions. And so please continue to uh, use that as a spot for connection. And, um, uh, and if you have questions for any of the panelists, I'll try to make sure to also get that to them as well. So with that, please go ahead, Derek. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. It's uh, early morning here in the Philippines, and I'm. I also want to uh, say my solidarity, our solidarity in behalf of our organization. We we send our solidarity with our uh, fellow uh, human beings in Pakistan who are uh, undergoing and experiencing a very very. Um, uh, sad experience on having the impacts of climate change. So thank you, Daniel, and thank you everyone for inviting me here. Um, as 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 you can see, there is no power here now because of the typhoon. So I'm just gonna uh, share my story very very in a short. Uh, I I hope this would be short. So. I'm, I'm a community organizer. Uh, our, our community that uh, I am organizing at the moment we has uh, 4,000 megawatts of uh, coal-fired power plants, and there is a, an expansion of, um, of um, uh, fossil gas. And uh, there is also plans to, to construct a waste-to-energy sources and the plans to build the Bataan nuclear power plant to rehabilitate. So I think uh, this would give you an idea of the community that I am organizing at the moment. But before I discuss that, I would like to share the story of my, myself and my family and how do we uh, continue um, uh, fighting and in solidarity with other, other Filipino citizens who are who have been uh, experiencing the impact of climate change. So I think as humanitarian actors and community organizers, I know you have seen many faces of you know, desperation, like, like what is happening in Pakistan right now and what it can do to people. In most cases, people forget about their dignity as human beings and thus they, they become even more vulnerable and defenseless. This is the kind of situation that many vulnerable communities are forced to live with every time a disaster event would take place or would, would strike. This was how Typhoon Ondoy or Ketsana has made me realize when it hit our country in 2009, which, which I think uh, more than 700 people have died during that typhoon. My family was one of the thousands 
that were caught up by the typhoon. And as flood waters um, rose up to 18 meter high, they huddled together on the rooftop of our two-story house. As the flood water swept past with bodies, can you imagine that? Animals and even a coffin because our neighbor was, you know, uh, having a, his wake at the time when the typhoon struck. It was like a horror scene in movie, only that you cannot turn off the button if the scene gets too terrifying for you to watch. So this happened in real life. Although I wasn't there as an eyewitness, I was as I was too stranded you know, in another place with my youngest sister. But on the other hand, my sister was updating us and describing every scenario through text messages. The fact that my whole family were trapped up in a life and death situation, and I have no idea on, on how to help them, was the worst nightmare I have ever imagined or I, I have ever experienced in my life. I believe disasters fueled by climate change have illuminated our vulnerabilities and powerlessness. I remember how scared I was at the time. I tried calling all the persons I know whom I thought has the power or influence to rescue my family trapped at the rooftop of our home, but you know they cannot go because it's, it's flooded. And I think no government ha has been competent enough to stop the evolving disaster at the time. You know, in my experience, uh, climate change, how it's affecting our communities, I can only imagine the situation would go from bad to worse and from worse to worse. Believe me, I feel weird that I have to share this bad news to you now. In fact, I am really angry. I am angry about the, our situation and I cannot just accept our fate. We can't just be statistics of climate change. That is the fact that we should not accept. Maybe some of you have yet to see the impacts of climate change, but this is why we are here right now, to share the stories of people who are at ground zero of climate impacts. Their stories are our stories because it is only a matter of time. It is only a matter of time until every one of us would suffer the same impacts of climate change if we do not act now. Likewise, we are not here just to share our stories, but I hope this, that the stories would also ignite and inspire everyone to take action. Let's encourage everyone to take action. I believe positive reforms happen only because we fought for it. No, we fought for it as a collective community. And the only, and the only way to realize this is if we try to get our acts together despite the difficult situations or difficult challenges. So we should take part and start doing our share in rebuilding our lives, but not only our lives, but also our communities. While we rebuild ourselves, we should be also at the forefront of the fight to make these big fossil fuel corporations accountable for their disregard to human rights and the welfare of the planet. Let us confront this system that fuels climate change and perpetuates injustices. This very system that priori prioritizes profit over the rights and welfare of the people and the planet. Lastly, let us strive to improve ourselves. Like we should strive to better ourselves. Uh, and the community so that the communities we engage or we organize would be ignited also and be inspired to take action with us so that together we would work for a better society and our planet because only the system change nothing short of systemic change could only save us from this from this ongoing climate crisis so with that, I'd like to end my sharing for you. I hope that uh, I have encouraged you and inspired you enough to really move on to the challenges and take it as you know as uh, in, it, it, take it as a challenge to um, move again and um, uh, join the global movement, join the people's solidarity to change the system and.
for social and climate justice. Thank you so much again. Maraming salamat at maganda umaga. Thank you, Derek. And one question that uh, I someone asked was, um, and we've talked about this, was conditions don't mean that people get what caused something. Because I experience a hardship, it doesn't mean that I know what caused it. I just know I experienced a hardship, but I may not then connect it to climate change. And so one of one of the previous speakers talked about the importance of political conscientization, the idea of bringing people along with their own story. And that's something that you do. Can you bring us into how do you, especially when someone's just experienced a hardship, it can be such a challenging time because I just need help. I don't need a lecture on science and climate, but how do you bring people into that? Because just because I've experienced climate change uh, doesn't mean that I know that I've experienced climate change. Well, in, in my experience, um, it, is, it, is the, it is the hope that uh, people should not undergo the same experiences that I, I had experienced in the past. I do not want them to, to experience the same, you know, having your own family uh, in, in, in a matter of life and death. So uh, when I talk to the people and the communities I organize, I am saying to them that imagine if your family and your loved ones are in a matter of life and death situation, what would you do? You do not have the power. Alone, you do not have the power. So this should be a matter of um, uh, prevention rather than cure. So it's like we should act together now now uh, 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 now because we still have time and we cannot just blame ourselves when there is no more time so until until uh we are not you know ex uh, unless we are experiencing the impacts right now of course the people are are you know just just you know um they just go with your emotions but you know, it's different when you're you know, when you're the survivor. We have to transform our grief, our sadness. We have to transform our our emotions right now into positive energy that can deliver changes, that can deliver reforms. And we can only do that if we are together. We can only do that if we are organized. Because as an individual, we can only do a little, in effect, a little of change. But if we are a community, we can do so much. It's like policies, we can reform. That's why I, I, I always believe that the people, they have the numbers. That's why the people, the power always resides with us because we have the number. Thank you, Daniel. I don't know if I answered that correctly. Yeah, no, I think that's beautiful. Reminding us the, that the the moment of hardship is a moment where people can feel so alone and so reminding people of the connection being being that connection uh to both a, a global community or a, just a neighbor that's what helps bring us together and so in those moments of loss and sadness it's a moment to say let's come together and so it's the togetherness that gives us power and so that's what i hear you urging us onwards for and one last thing before you have to go is um, you've also then organized people to then uh, use people power uh, in order to make this kind of change. And do you have any practices that you would advise for us um, that combination of both being an activist uh, who's working on a structural issue and someone who's working on supporting people just right where they are in immediate needs? Do you have any tips about how to do both of those things next to each other? Well, yeah, um, first, we should not think of ourselves like a hero, because there is no hero in climate change, because this, this uh, problem is a collective problem. So uh, every, every individual counts, every action, with us, even if it is little, it counts. So we have to remind we have to remind ourselves of that because there is no you know bigger bigger role but we have a role every one of us so uh, 
we we should do this because this is our contribution to 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 better the society to better the planet this is our share and we should not um i think um for me we should address the pre recognize the present emotion the present need the the, the and if we respond to that as also as humanitarian actors we should we should consider our intervention like what kind of intervention are we you know uh doing is it is it for is it helping is it helping the communities that we are organizing or is it for the benefit of our program or for our mandate you know just to say that we have been we have been helping them so we should restructure also our interventions ask the need ask the realities of the people that we are organizing and that's how we can we you know we can move on because there's so much emotions that we need to share it we need to have some people who would listen to us and that's what people are needing during times of disaster or even after they need to talk they need to be listened at because these are the problem the people the, the people in power usually doesn't listen doesn't know how our sufferings that's why we should not we should not duplicate that that uh that situation we should be on the other way we should be the ally of our organ or, or, or of our communities that we organize i think that's how i see it thank you derek um there's a lot of wisdom there and i i appreciate the reminder uh none of us are heroes we're just part of a collective of a community and i think especially for those of us from uh from global north i'm looking at you canada and users um that for those of us from the global north how much that needs to be reminded again and again so um i'm just really appreciative uh, uh of your sharing that way um so thank you derek uh i think we we got your wisdom and thank you so much i'm glad the the tech holds and best of luck as you weather the weather thank you derek um thank you and so thank you thank you daniel and thank you excellent excellent derek um and so i want to turn it over next to jennifer um uh who's coming from 350 canada and so jennifer uh has a presentation that's been crafted uh to talk about some of the work that they've been doing uh so i'm very excited so take it away jennifer everyone my name is jennifer and i'm a senior digital campaigner and organizer with 350.org canada i'm just going to take a moment to share my screen with you um, so i can get the presentation up can you see my screen okay Yeah, perfect. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, I um, I'm really humbled um, and honored to be sharing this space with all of you and my fellow presenters uh, to reflect on how we organize after climate impacts. Um, before I begin, I do want to acknowledge the traditional and ancestral territories I'm presenting from in so-called Canada. Uh, I'm calling from the unceded and ancestral territories of the Sioux Okanagan First Nation from so-called Okanagan, British Columbia. And before I begin, I also wanna, yeah, talk about the heaviness that's on my heart with, yeah, what's happening, you know, like Derek in the Philippines experiencing a typhoon while presenting um, the devastation that's unfolding in Pakistan. Um, and yeah, as I'm presenting my uh, sky, like my view, is covered in wildfire smoke because that's the normal for us here in British Columbia and across Canada is wildfires are very common and getting worse uh, and more frequent uh, in Canada. So uh, I just wanna share that anxiety and that heaviness that we're all coming into in this space. And so I appreciate all of you taking the time to hear from me today. Um, and so, yeah, uh, today I'll be presenting on one way uh, that we organized after climate impacts. And I wanna emphasize that this is just one way that we organized because there's many ways we need to organize 
after climate impacts. Uh, we have had organizing par partners support and organize direct mutual aid relief and efforts after climate impacts. Um, we've had partners focus on adaptation, supporting communities, um, experiencing climate impacts and how we alleviate those impacts in the future. Um, and what I'll be speaking to today is one way that we organized, which Derek and Daniel uh, touched on a little bit earlier, but how do we take people who have experienced a climate impact and kind of politicize them, um, contextualize the current moment, uh, acknowledge what's happening, and then, yeah, organize for change. Um, so let's dive in. So I'm going to share my story with you. Um, this is probably one of the most uh, severe climate impacts that I've experienced in Canada. Being in the global north, I feel like we have been shielded from um, fossil fuel extraction driven uh, climate impacts that the global south has experienced for decades and for years. Um, but last year in 2021, I was on maternity leave. Um, me and my husband run a small farm. And so uh, I was, it was very common for me to be out in the field with my then eight month old son and husband farming, planting our crops. Um, and it was kind of approaching summer and we always have a lot of fear and anxiety before we get into the summer because wildfires are becoming more common um, in our area and across Canada. And that always impacts our livelihood. Uh, my husband has really severe asthma. So to be a farmer working out in this kind of smoke that we even have today is always really stressful and hard on his health. And so, yeah, at the end of June, uh, we had one of the worst climate disasters um, in our in Canadian history, which was the 2021 heat dome. It was the deadliest uh, weather event um, in our history. And uh, yeah, I just remember uh, working in this extreme heat. We got what was a heat dome, a heat wave of 40 plus degree temperatures for a sustained period of six to seven days. Um, so we were out in the, in, in the field in these extreme temperatures because we, like many workers, uh, were, didn't have a choice but to be outdoors in these conditions, despite you know, our government saying, be indoors, stay safe. It's not, it's not that simple. And so I remember being out in the field in this insane heat where I felt like it was in a, I was in a, a pot of boiling water. I'd never experienced anything like this. It was difficult to breathe. Um, and I was away from my baby and the anxiety that that brought, it kind of, yeah, it just brings me right back. Um, it was a really difficult time. And so I think my story is just one of thousands of stories uh, across Canada. And my story had a happy ending in that I didn't lose anybody that I loved. There were over 600 people that lost their lives during this, this uh, yeah, tragic climate disaster. Um, so it's clear uh, in this moment and in Canada uh, and around the world that no community is safe from climate impacts anymore. Um, here in North America, like I mentioned, we've been shielded for so long from the devastation that fossil fuel billionaires and their political accomplices here in the North have caused to communities around the world and especially in the global South. Um, and every year climate impacts in Canada and the world are getting more frequent and severe and they're disproportionately impacting the global South. Um, and in this moment, uh, you know, the, the heat dome was a huge wake up call for many uh, it, like I mentioned, it was the deadliest uh, weather related disaster in our history and wildfires and states of emergency are now just the new normal for summers here in Canada and flood and extreme storms uh, are becoming more of a risk and becoming more frequent. Meanwhile, uh, our government here in Canada continues to sleepwalk critical climate action and delay their promises. They can, and they do this by continuing to hand out billions of dollars to the fossil fuel companies, um, delaying their climate promises, uh, like the Just Transition Act, which in Canada is this promise 
to put in critical supports for workers and communities as we prioritize and accelerate the transition away from fossil fuels to meet the scale and urgency of this crisis. Um, and it's also very clear that it's communities who are bearing the brunt um, of, of uh, our federal government continuing to prop up the fossil fuel industry in Canada. So what does this moment uh, mean for our movement? So as a team, we kind of got together um, and we identified that it's becoming clear that wildfires and heat are climate impacts that people, especially in Canada, feel the most. And by that, what we mean is people make the connection between a wildfire or heat event to climate change more than any impact we feel regularly in Canada. And the, the heat dome that I talked about was um, one of the worst impacts to date in our history. Um, and we know that these kinds of extreme heat and wildfire events will only continue to get worse and more frequent. Um, and we knew that it was important to mark the anniversary, one year anniversary of this heat dome this year. And more importantly, to hold our politicians accountable for climate disasters like this. And that it's a direct result of them continuing to delay and deny uh, the stakes of the crises we're facing. Um, and it also be, has become clear that impacts can be trigger moments, or as Daniel said, an opportunity to contextualize an impact a community has experienced and tie it to uh, the climate crisis. Uh, we've seen in the past uh, with events like Hurricane Sandy and wildfires, these can be moments if organizers respond in a timely, sensitive and effective way, an opportunity to build power and hold those accountable, responsible. Um, and so one of the ways that we responded to the heat dome and climate disasters that have followed since uh, was just to allow people to share their personal stories um, and uh, mark the anniversary of the heat dome. Um, and uh, yeah, one of the ways we did that was through a digital storytelling portal, which I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about. Um, and the reason why stories are so important um, is because it gives people a space and a place to share uh, their experience to commemorate, um, talk about what's been lost and sort of build our community after climate impacts. And this can be an important way to sort of move people to build and organize and see our power as a collective. And also that change is needed and it is possible. Um, and it's also an important moment to reflect, you know, especially with the heat dome and leading up to the anniversary. Um, we were seeing the news and the media report this as statistics and numbers and lives lost, but the devastation that follows a climate impact is more than just numbers. It's people, it's their lived realities, it's collective experiences, it's entire communities displaced. So it's important to take a moment to reflect on, on what's, what's being lost because of the climate emergency, to share a prayer, to share intentions, to connect and find ways to uplift and support direct mutual aid networks who are supporting communities directly. And we know that stories can speak more uh, to people and mobilize people than facts ever can. Uh, everyone has the power to tell their story. Everyone has a story to share and uh, stories to share of their communities. So stories have that ability to connect us, to inspire us, and to drive us to take action. Um, so that was the reason why we decided that it was really critical in this moment leading up to this anniversary to allow people to just to share their stories and politicize them to action. Um, so we, we launched the Living Through Climate Delay Our Stories portal. Um, and uh, it was a way for people to kind of uh, go beyond what the media and our politicians were saying and just create a space for people to come together to take action um, and to commemorate the lives lost due to worsening fire and heat seasons. Um, so in June, during the one year 
anniversary of the Heat Dome that week. We organized a day of action with partners and our communities uh, where communities across Canada came together to commemorate the lives lost, um, hold our politicians accountable directly for their delay in continuing to prop up the fossil fuel industry. Um, and a lot of incredibly powerful and moving stories came out of this day of action. Um, and then we launched the digital storytelling portal as a space for people across Canada to continue to share their stories and build that power and what it's like living through a climate disaster. Um, so I wanted to share one of those many submissions that we got. Um, this is a story from Jane who lost her sister in the 2021 heat dome um, and was part of the Victoria action in British Columbia. Um, so this was her first time ever speaking in front of a crowd and doing anything like this. So I'm gonna share Jane's story with you all if tech is on my side here. Won't let me click it one second. I promise it was working earlier. There we go. My name is Jane and this is my sister Tracy McMinley and she passed away last year. She was particularly vulnerable because she had schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. There's very vulnerable people who we need to look out for, right? And help them. And I spoke to her on the phone during the heat dome and she said she was coping, she was okay, and I should have gone there. We need to run in the direction of doing something and making our governments represent the people and not represent corporations, because their interest is not uh, people. Like, we need to care for other people. And sometimes I don't know what to do. This is my first public gathering. It's like, we need to do something, be proactive and stop being complacent so we can sign petitions and we can take action and we can meet with people. You gotta do something. Yeah, hearing Jane's story always makes me a little emotional. Um, but yeah, it was one of many powerful submissions that people shared during the day of action when this portal came active. Um, and uh, uh, the portal not only uplifted these stories, but it also highlighted the incredible mutual aid and organizing communities that have been directly impacted, um, what they were doing, that our governments and those in power actually need to take leadership from. Uh, communities made it clear that they aren't waiting around while governments delay and deny the stakes of this crisis, but they're, they're acting, they're they're, they're moving, they're mobilizing, and they won't stop fighting and holding our elected leaders accountable to these worsening disasters um, and that they're directly responsible for. Um, so people, uh, when they entered this portal, could make those connections and find ways to directly support any mutual aid efforts for current climate impacts. Um, and another way um, that we sort of amplified those stories was connecting them to a wider audience. Um, so uh, we transformed some of the submissions, of course, all of this with permission from those who shared their stories on this portal uh, into shareable content. Um, we get wide reach on Instagram Reels and TikTok here for our organizing. Um, and it's a community and a space where people are already showing, sharing their stories and building community. And this allowed the stories on the portal to get a lot more connection, engagement, and encouraged people to share their own story through the portal um, and find ways to take action. So I wanted to share this one story. I'll just read it out aloud really briefly. Um, if folks don't know, Lytton is one of the communities that um, last year uh, got uh, a really one of the worst wildfires. Um, it was right after the heat dome where we had those like insane temperatures and the community just like burnt to the ground. And so someone from that community shared their story. Uh, so I'll quickly read it. 
I lost my home in the Lytton fire of June 2021, both my current home and my childhood home. Before that, I didn't really realize the urgency of climate change. It always felt like a problem we'd be dealing with in a couple of decades. 2021 really illustrated to me that climate change is here. It's not a distant threat. It is already affecting us. Um, and yeah, and so when people were sharing their stories, they were also already politicizing themselves and saying that this isn't normal, we can't accept this as our new normal, and we need to hold those in power responsible. So what were the key sort of learnings for us in doing this um, storytelling portal and what the power of storytelling in action is after a climate impact? So one of the lessons that we learned was that climate impacts do drive public attention to the climate emergency. People may not know when um, an election is happening or when a really critical climate summit is happening, but they definitely notice when the world around them is on fire, underwater, experiencing a disaster. So it's important to define that moment for people um, and give people a pathway to build the movement um, and to build collective action. Um, we're in an emergency, so act like it. Uh, it's not just our politicians who need to act like we're in an emergency. When responding to climate disasters, uh, everything that we say that we do needs to scream, this is an emergency, we need to act, this is not normal. Um, so when putting this portal together and the day of action together, everything we chose from the imagery to the content to um, yeah, the platforms we utilized to get people's stories, um, communicated a sense of urgency, a sense of justice, um, and yeah, uh, what Daniel spoke to earlier, like contextualizing for people that disasters are because of the climate, are because of climate change, our politicians are accountable, we need to take action. Uh, lesson three for us was the best antidote to despair is action. Climate impacts can offer a powerful opening to humanize the crisis and mobilize the public. Um, we can be immensely impactful if we can find a way to treat these disasters as a mass movement building moment. We saw this last year after the heat dome and the record breaking wildfire season, thousands of people came together to share their stories and organize a day of action. And we saw it again this June when communities across Canada came together to organize um, the one year anniversary day of action for the 2021 heat dome to directly hold our politicians accountable for their delay on critical climate action and, and then telling their stories to make this message more clear and more loud. Um, timeliness is everything. So it's critical to act while the emotional weight of a moment people can still feel it and it's still resonating with them. And a lot is, I mean, we saw with these, this digital storytelling portal, a lot is possible in a short period of time when there's a clear time sensitive motive to act. So, you know, from the day of action to launching this digital storytelling portal, it was, to, it was right at the anniversary of the heat dome. It was an opportunity where people were looking for community, a place to share their stories. Uh, to, to push for change, to a way to take action. And uh, because of the timing, like it happening in the peak of summer when climate disasters are kind of, and the wildfires are the worst in Canada, um, a lot of people took action because they were looking for that space to take action and come together. Um, and as a digital organizer, I'm constantly thinking about <laughs> engagement onions and engagement pyramids, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I think what I want to stress here is it's really important to offer a variety of pathways to people to engage, build community, and share their stories. We met our base and our community where they were, and we gave them various ways to engage um, in this uh, project and then escalate them further. So, um, you know, whether it was through seeing a story on social media from someone or participating in this day of action, we took every opportunity to engage them and move them to the next level um, of, yeah, escalating their action uh, and holding our politicians accountable for it. And the last lesson I wanna share with 
all of you um, is personal stories we've learned need to be part of a bigger campaign uh, to give people and show people a pathway for change. Um, so uh, when we started to think about this day of action and this digital storytelling portal, we showed our base on a, mobilize, on a mobilization call when we were putting our plans together, what our plan was, and we presented a similar campaign arc or timeline for them. Uh, we showed them what the pathway is for taking action in this moment, how we can take action together in a way that escalates and builds our power. Um, and the digital storytelling portal success was because it was one of many ways points in a campaign um, working towards a larger mobilization for the solutions and the changes we need to see, especially here in Canada, in doing our fair share for tackling the climate crisis. And this allowed our base to connect the dots between the climate impacts that they were experiencing, politicizing them, uh, holding to hold our politicians and fossil fuel billionaires accountable to what they experienced and showing um, how winning bold transformative climate solutions is absolutely possible and achievable. And here's the way that we can do it. So with that, I'll stop talking um, and thank you for listening to me. Uh, if I don't get to answer any questions, cause I know we have not too much time together. You can always email me. My email is on the screen. And with that, I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and so if people do have questions, uh, feel free to post them or write them into the chat as well. Um, a, a few pieces that I just wanted to track. One, I just really wanted to appreciate the um, style difference of, of presenters. And I just, it's so consistent with uh, some of us have our presentations ready and some of us just share our story. And I, I just really want to honor uh, how, how, how we all share. Um, but one question uh, that I think um, just hearing this, I mean, you're really thinking about how to, uh, let's use the word utilize, how to utilize a climate impact in terms of bringing people, absorbing them into the movement um, and using that moment as a chance to bring people further in. And uh, I'm curious if you have um, any particular examples of people who have sort of done that that journey of had an impact and then they get brought in and how, what do you do after the moment that is to say after the impact is you know that the wildfires are over after the moment of the heat dome is over after that that moment often a lot of the energy drifts away because people are are hyped for that moment they're in a reaction for that moment their adrenaline is running in that moment and then they have to go back to their lives and and so forth. And so I'm just curious, like what you've learned about sort of keeping people uh, after that experience. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it kind of goes back to um, as a team and with our partners, we always think about the strategic law, bigger picture of the kinds of change we need to win and showing people it's absolutely possible. And so, for example, with this, um, sort of a day of action in this digital storytelling portal, once people had an opportunity to share their story, uh, we made sure we stayed in touch with them, whether that was through email, through social media, um, and gave them another way to take action, like an escalated way. Uh, like sharing your story was really powerful. There's an opportunity right now. And here in Canada, there's this federal government consultation around emissions cap that's open um, and it was a way to escalate their action. Like this is a really powerful opportunity to tell our federal leaders that they can't keep propping up the fossil fuel industry. And so giving people opportunities to continue to take action in an escalated way. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, that's kind of how we do it is we tend to have the next thing lined up and it's usually part of a strategic bigger campaign to win solutions, because at the end of it, we're gonna keep playing whack-a-mole with our federal government around approving fossil fuel projects and um, propping up the fossil fuel industry if we don't start to push for bold transformative solutions. Um, and so one way that we did that with people who shared their stories was absorb them into our base and keep in communication with them about ways to continue to take action to hold our federal governments accountable, no more delays, we're watching, we're not gonna allow you to keep 
sidestepping as climate disasters get worse. So I, I hear a number of pieces. One of the things that I'm reminded of is a, a campaign lesson of always plan for two actions ahead uh, so that you've got your the thing you're doing, but then what's next that you're, you're ready to prepare people for. Because after they finish an action, many people's first question is, so what's next? And so then you can begin organizing them back in. Um, and one other just question about the some of the mechanics of how you've been organizing since you're so thoughtful about that is um, in like these quick moments, it seems as though you've been doing a lot of your organizing digitally and that you're a digital organizer, that's your, that's your way of working. And are you finding uh, particular channels or particular ways that people are, are organically finding each other uh, during those moments? Yeah, so it's very common for us when, before we're gonna launch any kind of big action, whether it's a digital action or a day of action on the ground, we host mobilizing calls. So we get our base and anybody who follows us to jump on a call with us to hear our plans. And there's people always in the chat, in um, conversations with us, connecting the dots between what communities they live in, what climate impacts they're right now dealing with and coming together and forming those communities on their own. So the reason why actually the digital storytelling portal came up was because Jane was on that initial call where we were talking about, what do we do? This big moment is coming up where we're gonna commemorate the heat dome and Jane just decided to share her story with a bunch of strangers. And that kind of like catalyzed our plans and put a lot of pieces into place. So it's just about creating the space for people to come together and talk um, and form those communities. So um, yeah, we're always trying to create spaces for people, whether it's online or offline. Um, a lot of the stories that we put on the portal came from the day of action. We knew people would be coming. We knew people would be sharing their stories and commemorating. So we made sure we just had the tools to capture those stories and give them a wider audience. And there's just a question that just came through that that I think you might be helpful for as well, which comes from Paul, who's just asking about what do we do about people who are contemptuous of the climate movement, the folks who just look at the problem and just laugh in our faces about it. Um, and so Paul's just describing the nihilism that they're encountering just is really disheartening to them. So what do you do about that? Yeah, I sometimes like so for me as like a campaigner, it kind of just comes back to. Um, just connecting with people where they are. And the, and the way that I find doing that is just through sharing my personal story. So maybe if I share about like, you know, like this pipeline project or this, you know, fossil fuel offshore drilling project is something we need to stop. People might be like, you know, uh, very like, yeah, uh, unsure. If I share my personal story, that's not something people are going to disagree with, generally people are gonna wanna connect and they're gonna wanna hear and they're gonna wanna hear um, like, this is not okay. Um, and so I think just like getting to the heart of even what Derek was saying, like sharing our story, sharing our humanity, sharing the, the stakes of this crisis and that, um, yeah, uh, mobilizing and organizing is not this like untangible far and distant thing. It's something that we're, communities are already doing. When a climate impact happens, it's those exact communities that are on the front lines organizing and mobilizing supplies and supports. And so, um, yeah, this is one way that you can take action. It's, it's interesting. One of the things that your presentation reminded me of, uh, we're on the an anniversary moment here in Philadelphia. So those of you who are from Philly, you may remember that a year ago, uh, 676 was flooded. Um, and so we had a major flooding event and it was flooded sufficiently. So the entire highway, just so you have a sense of the highway sort of runs underground for a period of time. And the entire highway, 12 feet high, was fully uh, just filled with water. And so uh, it's a place where we drive and suddenly it's, it's completely underwater. And so uh, there's a group of people, Earthquake Action Team, who thought to themselves, we don't have a whole campaign framework yet. So we don't have what Jennifer had of an entire framework that we figured out, but we can figure out one step that we can do. And so what they did was they just hung a banner over uh, over on 676 so that people could see, uh, what's the banner say? It says, the climate is changing, why aren't you, Pico, which was their uh, target. 
uh, the energy utility company. And so they pulled together just this very specific action uh, that was a chance to highlight the injustice and, and highlight and sort of mark the story. And I think in some ways, Paul, this is my experience, which is for people who are deep into the climate denialism, uh, I don't find myself, I don't find trying to talk them into out of a denial position is very easy uh, because denialism is largely psychologically speaking, a way to block out, right? It's It's like, <laughs> I don't want to hear it. I don't want to get into it. And so I'm not going to be able to like break someone down uh, in that position, but instead it's about trying to find some different markers, different moments to notice. Ah, uh, this thing happened. That's unusual. This thing is not normal. That thing that's extreme is not normal. And to see which one of them they can connect with. And then we can talk. So finding a bunch of personal stories and seeing which one they might actually have some some ability to connect with and then working from that that spot. But it's very hard to work it just in, in that direct way. Um, anything else from you, Jennifer, that you wanna offer uh, before we uh, move over to Jacinta? No, that was everything. Thank you so much, everyone, for yeah taking you, time out to listen to me today. Thank you, Jennifer. This was really, it was really wonderful. Love it, love it. And so now we get to Jacintha. So Jay, uh, as she's commonly known in 350. And um, Jay, I, I just wanted to start just by saying, can you just tell us just two things, where you are right now, where you're joining us from, and just, just introduce us of your sort of your position, your work in the world. Um, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Um, I am calling Samoan Wathrong country, which is uh, West Melbourne um, in Australia. Um, but I am also a campaigner with the 350 Pacific team. Um, a newly campaigner, most of my experiences uh, come from an organizing background. So sometimes I blur the two um, naturally, I guess. Um, yeah. Is that, was that enough, Daniel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, so the Pacific is a, it, just a marking, right? The, the, the broad story of the Pacific Islands uh, has been one of resistance for quite a long time. And the, the phrase that has really been um, the heartbeat of the Pacific Climate Warriors is we are not drowning, we are fighting, which has been a position. It's a, it's a statement of, of urgency. Um, and so I want to invite you to share, like, share how you all have been navigating the different climate impacts and the relationships, the web of community that you have been building over the last couple of years, because you're conscious of seeing an a impending crisis that every new typhoon creates a new uh, journey with. So bring us in. Um, I'll do my best. Um, yeah, so our motto, yeah, uh, like when I hear it in crowds, when we're pro like chanting it out, like, I, yeah, I'm, I'm never used to like the impact that it would have on me emotionally. I'm always um, one of the many that would just start crying when we're, you know, chanting out, uh, we are not drowning, we are fighting. And I think because it's just always like revealing new layers of how much that means to us where we are at in the world and in the situation we're, that we're in. Um, so yeah, it's, it's almost like a living motto with us. And like, we all have a very like grounded understanding that like, it's not a new message. It's something that our people have been saying for the longest time. And um, when we're given the opportunities to amplify that, like, like yes, we will uh, without a, a second thought. Um, but I, yeah, listening to all the stories that we've heard so far, like, uh, uh, there's a lot of like similarities and, um, this week for me has also been like a really like special week and I didn't think I was going to talk about it, but it kind of weaves in a lot of the things that I'm feeling. So, uh, earlier this week, we had a very special tour um on like the traditional lands for the Gomorrah people uh which is in New South Wales it's a very popular region for uh coal mining and um um I guess it was like this really I don't know new incentive to like 
before we launch a big campaign that affects the, especially these people who are dealing with these problems, let's go spend some time and just listen to all the stories of um, activism um, that they've been putting up a fight for the like, many, many years. And so, uh, yeah, it was really special to like be, have that opportunity to like listen uh, firsthand from like the people who are experiencing ex uh, the extraction of the fossil fuel industry. And then for me to like also keep in mind, like, yes, this is like the impacts that it's having for like the, the my people in the Pacific. And so like, I'm constantly thinking with like, my organizing and campaigning hats, like how, I'm, what, there's an opportunity here. How can I connect that work, especially with our Pacific Climate Warriors Network, our diaspora teams is very, uh, like it's growing fast. And so um, always thinking of those opportunities, but yeah, so this tour was like a really gracious opportunity to, to listen to these stories specifically of resistance from the coal mining giant known, known as Whitehaven, um, who have been operating on these lands for a long time. Uh, it was like an overwhelming experience, but it was also refreshing. And I think it speaks to like, we are in this moment of launching this new campaign um, let's you know let's get their blessings of these people who have been doing this work for uh before us um but hearing their stories i had this feeling of like um like we're late to the party kind of vibe like um you know where like the these people who have just come from the city we're going out on to like rural areas and hearing all this work and it's just like oh like you know um yeah, what, what can we do? You guys have done everything and are doing such an amazing job. Um, and so like there was that feeling of um, like hopelessness and despair. And it took me back to like the first action that I ever took part in, which was the canoe flotilla back in 2014. And it um, is also like the beginning of the coal campaigning for Pacific Climate Warriors, um, where they use traditional canoes to blockade, you know, the world's uh, largest coal export, uh, which is, you know, on the same region where this tour took place. And so I was just having this like, you know, all these things were happening in my mind, like connecting this history and the stories um, and trying to be present um, as well. And um, where am I going with this? Um, I guess, um, yeah, I, like I'm also acknowledging like my experiences are very different from living outside of the Pacific. And so I always need to remind myself my role in this work is like amplifying and being in solidarity. And I find my comfort of organizing is very rapid responsy. Um, you know, hearing that call to, to cook, to clean, to report, to mobilize, to amplify, like, um, like something clicks in me to respond. And, and I know like, yeah, I just, I guess I just work in that way. And when I was at the tour, after feeling that like late to the party vibe, um, that started to click in. And I was just like trying to see what can I do? How can I bring my communities back to this region? How can I support the work of the traditional owners and the indigenous folks who have been on this fight? You know, land rights is a very complex, full of nuances, especially when working with farmers who um, have property on, from settling on, on those lands. And so, yeah, I'm always looking for those opportunities. So I like linking the history of the canoe flotilla, feeling like learning about climate change for the first time and think, feeling hopelessness. And then like something would click in and I'd be inspired and I'd have no idea what I'm doing, but like my, I guess like my spirit is like guiding me to do the things that need to be done. And that happened again this week at the listening tour. Um, and so like, yeah, just wanted to like put that out there because it's a very raw thing that just happened earlier this week. Haven't fully processed it, but I, I know there's something there that I could offer to everyone that's here. Um, I'm also acknowledging that there are different types of ways that, um, you know, uh, mobilizing in response to resistance and the whole um, 
the elements of repairing can can take shape. You know, we have to adapt to these new normals uh, and be more intentional of how it works, building new spaces for our communities to connect and to learn virtually like we have been learning in the last couple, like during the pandemic, I guess, has been very intense virtually. <laughs> Um, you know, these moments inspired many firsts for our network uh, in our Pacific teams, our Pacific Power Up trainings, our fellowships. Yes, it was a, a technical training, but there was also this call to create space for healing and finding joy and purpose to like keep our communities connected. Um, our first responders, you know, who are there on island to help with uh, cleaning and repairs after um, disasters whether they are clearly climate related or not um storytelling we've heard earlier that you know storytelling is very powerful you know it's our frontline truth so this gives people an opportunity to share their realities which is also a form of healing um and uh yeah it echoes both what jennifer and derek had talked about you know community and gatherings are so important because it's a powerful way to respond to hardship um, and the feeling of being isolated and afraid, you know, leaning into the power of stories and storytelling. Um, okay. Yeah. One of the things, one of, sorry, one of the things that I, I just, I want to underline that you're offering is that in these moments, uh, there's different kinds of responses that come up inside of us. Some of us are, Derek is, an, Derek is a classic organizer, right? Her response was, let's organize, let's talk about people power. And you also have another response inside of you, which is let's let's figure out where to be where to where to be a helper. Um, and I, I'm remembering uh, Mr. Rogers was asked. Uh, I believe this was after 9/11. Mr. Rogers was asked, um, "What do you tell people in in awful situations when an awful thing has happened?" And he said, uh, "What do you tell a kid?" And he said, "You tell kids to look for the helpers." wherever they are, whatever, whatever the, no matter how bad situations are, they're always helpers and they're always playing a role. And so that's a role that you've played historically during some of these climate disasters that have happened. Again, whether they were marked as a disaster related to climate or not, but the increasing you know, rate of, of typhoons, hurricanes. And can you give us an example of uh, like a story of when, when, when you have responded in that way and what that's looked like on the ground? Because it looks really different um, in your community than in some of our other communities. And so I'd love to just for us to get a sense of the ways that folks um, respond after both before, during and after a, a, a crisis of that sort. Yeah. Um, uh, one story that one of my favorite ones, which is a very short story. Um, um, yeah, one of the tropical cyclones that took place in, I, I think, in Fiji. Um, and uh, I think there was like a reporter that was trying to track like the realities of like people being, you know, in despair and, and feeling hopeless. And but in the background, you just had like a whole bunch of like people singing songs and um, finding joy while they were like cleaning um, their, their, their communities. Um, but a, a more recent example is, um, I think this was under our rapid response work, um, but um, it was like finding the structures that are already in our communities to support each other that they need and acknowledging that we're not an aid agency, but um, uh, because of our proximity to our work around climate impacts, our closeness to our communities that are called to respond and provide support after climate impacts, and this was our team, our warriors in Tonga who mobilized after Cyclone Gita, um, which was like to clean and make sure the schools and the villages were safe. Um, this structure that existed in response to that cyclone was the same structure that was used to mobilize in the aftermath of the volcano that happened um, so earlier this year, or last year, um, to provide support. And so, um, like that example really provided this opportunity of like launching the solar scholars work which i know we've but, been working before we get there can you describe the the structure what did that structure look like oh yeah what, the was, what was yeah because uh like th yeah bring us into what that structure looks like yeah so um we have so 
I guess what made it helpful is we have a a team in Tonga and our coordinator was in touch with us, giving us updates on the situation that was at hand. And the first thing that everybody needed was, um, you know, access to clean water and, you know, um, uh, and, and stapled food. And so to do that, we needed to do some fundraising. So we were able to do a call out to our teams outside of Tonga to do some fundraising while our teams in Tonga were doing, um, uh, mobilizing their communities by like creating teams to do cleanups, teams to uh, see uh, which families uh, you know needed what to do, it was sort of like a, a need for a stock take. Um, and this went on for a couple months, but that I think the the, the importance in the structure here was uh, the ability to communicate. Um, after that disaster, a lot of the, the phone lines were down, Wi-Fi was not available. And so for us to be able to um, to provide funding so folks could get um, access to Wi-Fi, that opened up our, uh, the, uh, our ability to communicate and have a lot of the organizing offshore to, to take place. Got it. And that leads naturally into the reason that you end up doing the scholars program. So take us there. Yeah, so the um, it's very early stages, but um, I guess there was this need for solar scholars in the Pacific because it was inspired by the aftermath of Cyclone Gita in Tonga, uh, where people were huddled around uh, power points um, at churches to try and find power and, and Wi-Fi to connect with family. Um, so the whole idea of having um, like solar panel or tech packs, it was to empower our communities with the tools and the resources that they need to build their own solar panel system after a disaster. Um, and so as an organizer or a, as a campaigner, we have this task to like redesign and contextualize this work um, to one to bring it to life, but also to make it accessible. Um, but yeah, that was the, the solar scholars piece. And as I understand it, the solar projects are that emerged out of, I guess, the Philippines it may have been the place where, is that right? And so they had created these things to be these generators after a crisis that people can have power immediately. Because again, as we just saw with Derek, people lose power. That's one of the first things to go. Um, and so it becomes a, a, a resource. And where did, where did those solar, like, where do you imagine those things getting set up? Yeah, so because of, you know, seeing the photos of um, community huddled around churches and church uh, religion is a very um, a, a big element of uh, Pacific culture. And so it, it felt fitting to like um, picture these or plan for these panels to be built on churches as the symbol of like after a disaster, people want to seek safety and, and churches are, you know, one of the big places that uh, all communities first think of to, 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 to gather. And so having a church and having, uh, it, providing them with that equipment to like power up their communities to get back online, um, yeah, kind of created this really beautiful narrative of, um, yeah, disaster response in the Pacific and what that looks like. And so, so you've got, you've got people like, uh, trained, getting trained into using these and, and figuring out the systems for that. And so part of this is, uh, in, in this sense, you all have an experience of dealing with climate impact over and over and over again. So it's not that you always know what's coming, but that you know some of the things to expect and to prepare for. And so creating yeah. those systems. And so it's so valuable for us to then think about what are some systems that we should learn if we're not in that situation. But also, what are some of the different psychological things that you have put in place? What are some of the different ways that people hold themselves to not live in uh, constant fear, constant uh, anxiety for what's coming next? What are some of the, the ways that, 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 that that's being built as well? Yeah, I think, well, like the the, the Solar Scholars um, project, uh, it was one of those ways of responding to what people were feeling. It was like um, feeling isolated and, and having to wait for support and aid. Um, but like we can give them these resources where they can 
be the, the, the resource and aid for their communities themselves. Um, the, um, how do I wear this? I think it, it's definitely something a lot of us are working through at the moment, you know, coming back, um, being away from each other, having so much of our capacity in rapid response and um, yeah, that, um, what do you call my gosh? face-to-face -face interaction or in-person interaction and how, pan how the we pandemic- used to call it meeting people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Seeing people. <laughs> um, yeah, like being apart. And so now that, you know, we're able to do all these things we used to do back in the day, we're planning, you know, for a new strategy in, a, in, the, few, uh, in the next few years, uh, whether you have been a part of this movement um, and you're like wanting to come back, um, I think um, community, the importance of community and gatherings, it's a space for like healing and sharing stories. Art um, is also a very powerful tool. I recently heard this quote where it was, um, oh my gosh, testing my memory again. Why would I do this to myself? Um, when culture is threatened, art is art becomes a weapon. Um, and so that's just like really, it's sitting with me really, really well this week. And um, yeah, and stories and storytelling. And I think these have been a great source of guidance for not only this work, but also to like uh, respond to all the different things that people may be feeling and um, just holding that space, I think, um, you know, September is usually a big month of mobilizations for us in the Pacific, but like we know meeting out where our teams are at, we know they're just not ready for that. And so we're making that space to allow them to like, yeah, to do what they need to do to be, to be able to, to show up to this work. And, um, yeah, that's just been, a like a new lesson for me as well this year, I tend to work at the pace of how the climate movement in Australia works, but also I'm, I'm tied, I'm connected to the work in the Pacific and it's a, a completely different pace and it requires, uh, you know, different tools and different work. So, yeah. I, I appreciate it. In, in the US, at least in some of the groups that I've worked with, we, we talk a lot about mutual aid. That's the phrase that we use. Um, and I know that's that's gotten globalized in a, some strange ways, but the the way that you're talking about people, just people to people finding support, and that one of the things that creates such anxiety amidst a climate impact moment is people not feeling like I know how to be helpful. And so when we provide people a way to be useful, a way to to offer something, that that even if it even if it may not be it, it's not going to solve the problem that's not what we're doing here we're not being heroes as Derek says but it's about being able to offer something so I, I hear you talking about that as a as a key component of what you all offer to support the psychology of people and then to also continue that through after the moment has happened but but then building a weaving a community through music and song and and so forth during and, and after that that event can you tell us just other things that you have found, other advice that you have for uh, for those of us who who are experiencing climate impacts or will experience climate impacts as organizers um, that you found in, in, important lessons for us to to bear in mind? Yeah, I think the uh, you mentioned it earlier. You know, we're not heroes or trying to be heroes. Um, like we don't have the answers to everything, and I think being transparent that. This is a learning journey and um, understanding that like being an organizer also means to be of service to your community. And that for me completely flips like the way I need to show up in this work. I am serving my community, not like um, the climate movement, so to speak, or like, you know, what's happening outside of this world, but like looking more inwards into like the needs of our communities to be able to show up and, um, yeah, stepping into the light to try all the things to like model the possibilities that this world can, you know, um, provide, uh, can offer you. Or like, I, I think we hear a lot that there's not enough representation seen in this work. So like, I tend to just 
demonstrate yeah try all these things and i feel like it, it's worked really well with like our younger diaspora communities who have all these really wild and crazy and colorful ideas but you know they say they don't see enough of that in our work so it's like all right i'll create the platform let's see what you got and and it creates this like buzz and excitement and sort of this like you know the way you know the climate movement was for me when i first joined it was this really fun space of community who all had the shared purpose we all, we're all on the same page we all want the same things and let's use all the tools <laughs> to do the work and um yeah that's been uh something i always come back to thanks jacinta anything else that you want to like other pieces that you want to share or present about uh about your work and, and insight for us I feel like I've said so much. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> um, not in that way, but the good way. <laughs> there's, just, there's a lot to, to digest. So um, I, I just want to say thank you, uh, Jay, for, for your sharing and Jennifer and Derek as well. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that, that I'm holding uh, as, a, as a tension point, so just for me personally, uh, my, my neighborhood's flooded twice in the last year. Uh, and we've experienced, um, uh, we live right next to the river. Uh, and so we've, we've experienced some of this, some of the flooding. And, and in that sense, it gave us, it wasn't disastrous uh, as a moment, but what it was, was it was a uh, wake up call for many of our neighbors about something is afoot. And it became a chance to, I think, do three things. And I think this is often where we are around climate impact, which is one, um, just building the neighbor to neighbor community relations, it became an opportunity where I could talk to all of our neighbors and say, hey, what did you experience? And that became my connection point to them. It became a chance for me to then think about how do I offer something specific to them? So with one neighbor, we canoed from one house to the next to connect to them. And so we just got that human to human connection. And the second that emerged fairly organically was, uh, building a community resilience response for, for next time for, for dealing with the moment. In our case, because it wasn't as severe, it was working on trying to build a, extend a little bit of our berm and, and build some, some, uh, some waterways to sort of move water around from, from what we're gonna expect in the future. And so we've already begun doing that. Some of our neighbors have, have bonded and we started building these concrete berms but surviving isn't just about those things. And there's a third piece, which is, and I, I think each one of you has taken us into that, um, which is taking people in the moment and also beginning to move them to address the issue of the climate crisis itself. Because my neighbors, if we just build a berm, that doesn't help us on the whole, on the globe. And what we also need to do is we need to continue fighting the climate crisis. And so what we're doing is this process of dealing with immediate neighbor to neighbor, dealing with the crisis in front of us. And then as we have the space and the attention, beginning to build, pe build people and build systems so that people can organize, mobilize, do, the res do more than just survive, but also really go out and, and fight the, the fossil fuel industry that's creating this problem, that's generating uh, this crisis in the first place. And so I just appreciate all of your stories connecting that. Um, and so thank you to um, Jay, thank you, Jennifer, thank you, Derek. Um, thank you to everyone for participating and, and coming and joining uh, this particular session. So this is as far as we had imagined uh, for where we were. And I also heard uh, Dawood, who's in Pakistan right now at 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 5.30, uh, had said that they wanted to just share like a, a word or two um, uh, just about uh, where they are. So Dawood, I'm just going to bring you on uh, just to, if you want to share just a few words about where things are. Um, and I, we're not going to go too long um, on this particular piece, just because I know there's there's many things to cover. But but if you want to just give you you express an interest to just give a few words. So I'm hoping people can hold some attention for Dawood, who's just in the middle of it. So uh, let's give a, the best attention that we can. Dawood, you there? Can you listen to me? Yes. 
Okay, so uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to say a few words and uh, thanks everyone for showing this solidarity with the people of Pakistan. And uh, <clears throat> what I would like to contribute is that I personally believe that most of the people, including here in Pakistan, do not understand the scale of the disaster that has happened right now. So although Pakistan only contributes 1% of the greenhouse cases, but the disaster that it is facing in terms of droughts, in terms of wildfires, floods, and uh, even locusts are attacking parts of the country. So the, the scale of the disaster that is currently going on is so huge that I'm afraid that the this may convert into a sort of crisis, a health crisis, a, a sort of food shortage crisis. So I'm, I'm very happy that the world community has come together to support, but, but the point is that the local governments need to be strengthened, need to be aware that, that those people who are unreachable by roads and those who are living in the rural areas are, are reached and they are provided with the support that they need. need. Because I'm highlighting this because the, the, the natural calamity is now exacerbated by the way the Pakistan government is responding. The only hope that we have seen here in Pakistan is the, is the local organizations and the individuals that are supporting on the ground. This is so heartening, I mean, to see for me at least. So uh, I missed your question, I'm sorry, because uh, when I joined as a panelist, I could not listen to you for a moment, then I, uh, I, I, I was cut off. So I just wanted to say that the world should come together and pressurize at least the government of Pakistan. Why well, I would say that because it needs a, a, a global response because the scale of the problem is such that I, I don't believe that it has happened ever in Pakistan. It's unprecedented, the gushing. I mean, the videos, if you see the number of deaths that have been reported are very less, uh, but, but the people who have seen the, the, the situation on the ground, who have traveled to some parts of the country are saying that, that it is a huge problem in a country where there is 750 mortality rates. Uh, 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 I mean, uh, the health system is so poor that it cannot respond even to the usual needs of the population. So how can it respond to, to a malaria uh, you know, uh, problem or uh, to food, food shortage problem or anything like diarrhea, which is already prevalent, the cholera is, I mean, having an outbreak in Pakistan. So there are a lot of things. I, I wish I had uh, the time to talk about them, but but me being a person related to public health and activism, uh, I have been listening to and receiving all the emails from 350, but, but they say here in our part of the world that you will never talk about seat belts until and unless you meet an accident. So now the people are now talking about how this climate change is affecting us, how the entire buildings were even wiped out in such a huge manner that it was like, a, uh, I'm sorry to say like a Hollywood movie. So most of the people, most of the panelists and listeners in your conversation would not be aware about the scale of the disaster, but the people here who have witnessed it, and unfortunately, the way the response has been, it's not very heartening. The only thing which is heartening, I would repeat, is the, the people's response, the individual's response, and the local small organizations and philanthropic foundations that are responding. And I again thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk to you and, uh, and, and everyone who expressed solidarity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dawood. Thank you so much for, for sharing and, and being up at this hour. I, I do hope you get some sleep as well. Um, I mean, this is, this is the reality that we are indeed facing. And so I, I so appreciate you speaking on behalf of your people and, um, and where we are is a situation in which there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work to do for all of us. There's work to prep and prepare our local communities, our local governments, our national governments, and our international relations for the, the crisis that's ahead of us and the crisis that's happening right now. And so my heart goes out to you, Dawood. Um, and I, I repeat, I think the, the emphasis of this call really is a reminder about building up these systems. I started this call by asking everybody to breathe. And I just want to invite us to do that again. That's, that's one thing that we have as, as humanity, which is our breath together. And so I just want to invite us together to take a collective breath, just to, again, get your feet on the ground. And let's just take three breaths together. And as we do that, just hold as much as you can in your heart.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Tech. Thank you, Dawood. Thank you, uh, all the people who attended. Thank you, everyone. Thank all the people who um, are watching again on the recording. We'll send that out to you afterwards. Thank you, everyone who's watching um, live as well. Really appreciate everybody coming. Um, we will send out the recording to everyone on your email. Katie's going to paste a link um, if you want a certificate for attendance or also to give an evaluation form. Um, and again, thank you everyone so much. I hope you have a great evening, morning, afternoon. Uh, much love, much blessings, much power. All love.